right, so thank you for coming, Eric. Uh, thank you for your time. Uh, can you introduce a little bit yourself, a little bit? Where do you start it, and how do you start in, the, in this crazy world of rigging and tech anim? Hmm. Um, <clears throat> from uh, the beginning, uh, I started as an animator in the games industry, but I've always been curious to see how things work and. Uh, at the time at uh, Ubisoft, the modelers were doing the rigs using uh, Character Studio, mm. gross. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so <clears throat> there was obviously problems with the rigs and nobody wanted to deal with it because somehow rigging was something everybody hated to do. And I thought, well, maybe I can help with that. So I thought I went and um, was Paul, Paul Neal's DVD series on rigging on 3D Studio Max was the first um, oh. where I kind of started to learn rigging at the time. <clears throat> then, um, yeah, I did a little custom rig at home and was super happy. And then uh, I switched to being a rigger at a different studio. And then, <clears throat> as you know, as things went alone, mm -hmm. um, as you do rigging, you learn a little bit of scripting to help with rigging stuff. Yeah. But then you go from being the guy that knows how to rig to the guy that knows how to script. And they're like, oh, Eric, can you script this and <laughs> script that? And then I became a pipeline TD at, uh, I don't even know which studio. There's just too many studios. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But yeah, over time, I transitioned to uh, being pipeline and just uh, writing code for a living. I did that uh, for a few years. And... Um, then I did a little uh, stop at Image Engine where I did some CFX in Houdini, and that was a good lot of fun too. Then I did um, some freelance rigging for a while, and then uh, now I'm doing R and D at EA. That's cool, man. I I think it, it's like we was talking before on the warm up that you did the, the first circle. You started in in games and ended up in games. That's that's cool. I think now you have probably. The full spectrum of the on um, the like say digital character industry, let's say, <laughs> like yeah. And I've also worked on TV and commercials during the time as well. Okay. So I feel like I've only missed the animation industry. Okay. That's the that's the only one that I haven't yeah. touched. Do, but do you miss animation? Do you miss uh, uh, to be an animator? Hmm. I wasn't an animator for very long. Like it was like the first year of my career that I was mm -hmm. animator, and that the last fourteen years I, I haven't been animating. Uh, I see. <clears throat> um, I enjoyed it, but I feel like the m most rewarding thing for me is uh, helping people, mm. like by making rigs for them or making scripts for them, kind of feeling useful, you know, in the team. And I feel like as an animator, I'm I'm more like, oh, I'm making good animation, and that's making me happy, but being a good rigger or making tools then yeah. I help a lot more people and a lot more people are happy and that feels more rewarding yeah I, I, you know it's 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 kind of funny I, I commented already on, on the podcast but yeah it's it's quite similar where I started like I, I started as an animator or generalist because back like uh, mm -hmm. I don't want to date myself too much but back in the days was more generalist everything especially in Spain it was not not really like you do 3D animation yes that's it it's the general thing and I was turned out that I was an animator for a few years but was probably awful animator and little by little I, I switched to rigging because I, I felt like it was more like you say like more value to the, my colleagues doing rigging uh, it, it was maybe like feeling uh, like better like because you saw your 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 value on the, on the rigging side, and you have for a lot of, uh, unless for me, I have much more fun doing rigging or than doing animation. Even I, I thought I wanted to be an anim animator, but yeah, I think uh, it's nobody wants to be a rigger out of the blue. I think it's something that you need to discover on the on the journey, and and some people find that it's something that they're meant for, for to do and some people just hate it I, I i i see some videos on youtube even saying like awful things about reading like it's a evil uh, necessary evil things like that what wait 
what it is <laughs> what but it's so much fun <laughs> yeah of course uh, at least for for us i think it's so much fun it's like uh, making i don't know like playing with lego or just solving these puzzles and things like that if you if you like to to solve problems i think it's it's a really nice uh like uh niche to be or like uh yeah something to yeah, it's very rewarding doing something that most people can't do and then when you make something that seems impossible work and then everybody's like wow but we thought this was not even possible like ah oh uh, uh, yeah yeah i think there was in twitter i think i saw once the someone uh it was saying something like um when people ask me what i do i say um uh a, car a td technical director because uh it was fucking mi miracle maker is not a job title <laughs> something like that it was I, I don't remember the slogan it was like a kind of uh yeah super hardcore but <laughs> it was like funny like yeah <laughs> miracle maker is not a job title of course <laughs> but yeah some sometimes yeah uh it's really nice when you you get to solve problems that are like looks like difficult or the people don't see a possible solution and you you hit the the eureka or or the solution um yeah i'm just gonna for the people doesn't know you this is your website that i have open here euler r and d and i'm just gonna play your your demo while we are talking because i, I i'm i was watching it before we started and it's amazing and you tackle a lot of um stuff not only like rigging but you do character effects you do pipeline and you do it in almost all the software available in the market i guess uh you have houdini maya max and you playing with blender also um, yeah i haven't i haven't played with blender um uh, but i also worked in the xsi for a little bit too oh yeah i I, did. I, have, I have asked, had to write uh, tools for Nuke also for compositing and it's like, wow, that's not even remotely re related to where I started, but mm. that's just, that's like, at the time, how can I be useful? And they're like, well, the compositors need help, Eric, do you think you can help them? Mm. Well, I don't know, but I can try. Do, do you like when, uh, because for me, I, I had similar experience. Like when I was uh, in, in Montreal uh, at Shed, I ended up doing like also some tools for pipeline, like little scripts for Nuke and helping other uh, colleagues like with some scripts for uh, Houdini also, and taking like like Shotgun and uh, pipeline tools in integration. But do you like that part? Because I I found it was not like character related, so I I found hard to do it. I mean I did it because it was my I mean, was my job doing it there? But I found not really like enjoying us when I work with characters. How about you? How... Um, I feel like the most fun thing for me to do in my day-to-day -day work is learning new things. So when these kind of challenges come, I'm thinking like, oh, that's not really useful to me or it's not a skill that I have yet. But I think, well, maybe I learned something from there. So let's let's just do it. And I try to focus on the learning aspect of these unrelated tasks mm -hmm. to discover new skills or new new ways of doing things that I can then later apply to things. Yeah, I, uh, yeah, that's a good like uh, point of view. Like if you if you tackle all these things as a a learning process where you can like learn something new and 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 incorporate it to to other tasks later. That's that's really really great but yeah sometimes I, i'm for me well the experience is like i'm afraid that you're gonna get like in this not say black hole but you know like something that that attracts you with so much uh, like gravity that you it's hard to get out later you know what i mean like mm. I, I have friends like a couple of friends that then started like as riggers and they step a little bit on the pipeline and then get absorbed and vanish on the pipeline world and never came back to rigging they enjoy it mm. i mean it's not like they they are like forced to do it but uh, i don't know i think it's not for me <laughs> like 
Oh yeah, but you'd come back to our characters all the time, no? So it didn't happen to you. Yeah, I mean, like right now at at work, I'm only writing code. I'm not doing rigs anymore, <clears throat> but I do rigging projects at home to keep keep up to date with rigging in general. Uh, not to because yeah, sometimes you know you see people they get disconnected from production a little bit. And then after a few years, they kind of forget how it is to work in production. Mm -hmm. And then the tools that they make to help production becomes less relevant because they're distanced themselves. Mm. Yeah. But um, I think this uh, being open to various tasks and software has been a, a really good thing for me. Um, one example is that uh, at Image Engine in the interview, they were saying like, oh, we would like to do some CFX in Houdini. Do you want to do some CFX in Houdini? Uh, we haven't started the department yet, but do you want to, you know, get in and start that? Wow. I was like, well, I've never opened Houdini before, so <laughs> I, I, I'm, I'm open to this idea. It would be a lot of fun to learn this, but, you know, just so you know, I, I don't know Houdini yet. And they're like, oh, that's cool. We'll just, we'll just show you Houdini and then we can do this. <clears throat> and I feel like most people would be afraid. They would say like, but I don't know this software, so I can't even think about taking this job because it's crazy. I don't know this software, but I feel like if you just take the challenge with that requires skills you don't have, then it forces you to get these skills because then you're like, well, okay, now I've taken this challenge. Now I have to learn this. And then, yeah, a year later at Image Engine, when they were hiring new people, they were introducing me. They're like, oh, oh, that's Eric. That's the Houdini guy. If you have some Houdini questions. And like, <laughs> a year ago, I haven't had an open Houdini yet, so you know, take it easy. <laughs> yeah, that's cool. I mean, you, you, I mean, yeah, probably you, you, you get it really, really fast. And I, I bet it's, um, yeah, you jump on the production. So probably some people studying Houdini for many years or you know playing around but never using it as a like I need to do this specific thing and uh, like project based uh, like learning they they will take longer like to of course learn. it's yeah, it's so much easier to give up on your learning if you don't have a deadline or a milestone to meet if you're at home and you're like oh I'm just gonna learn this and then you're blocked you're like Oh, this is not working. Okay, well, just you know, I'll just stop this. Yeah. But if you're in production and there's a delivery and you run into this problem, like oh, I don't know how to fix this, then you go and you do research and you find people. You're like oh, I need to fix this because mm -hmm. I have this delivery. So it forces you to push through the mm -hmm. difficulty of learning. Yeah, that's. I mean, it's a good good strategy. If I mean, if it doesn't fail at the end, <laughs> like <laughs> there's always like a some risk <laughs> there, but. It's a really good strategy to learn something. Is you, yeah, 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 I can do it. I don't know how, but I will. <laughs> and then oh, you I mean, it. of course, yeah. as long as you're being honest, you can, yeah. you know, go in an interview and say, "Oh, I can yeah. work in this software, no problem." Like, you know, I, I was forward and I said, "Oh, I have never opened Houdini, so you yeah. know." Yeah, yeah, of first, course. The first few months, I'm gonna be slow with that, that and yeah. then, like, you know, but that's still, fine. Like, impressive. Like, especially Houdini, it's um, it's well known. It's like software that it's uh it's uh, really hard to 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 expertise on on because it's it's vast it has a lot of possibilities a lot of uh workflows a lot of uh, like even the I, I don't know that much but you have like this it's the 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 how, how they call the the bex it's the language that they have the null thing and yeah and then you have the high level notes that are like the the regular like node flow no it's how it works then sorry i'm just maybe like butchering here but it, it's how it works um, like do you have the yeah. bags that is more like low level thing and you have the the regular nodal thing that is like the high level no it's or oh, I'm, I'm wrong there i yeah i think the thing with houdini is that everything is low level like you have the building blocks okay the low level building blocks to do anything you want which is very scary at first because you can do everything including doing it wrong mm -hmm. um, but once you've learned it you you basically have infinite power mm -hmm. um, but of course the learning curve is a bit it's it's a bit scary at first because mm -hmm. 
the way things are existing in Houdini is a bit different. Like when I transitioned from 3D Studio to Maya, there's still it's still different, but there's a there's a lot more in common. Like you know the objects, the like <clears throat> in Maya, I was like, oh what? The transform in the shape is two different nodes. That's crazy. Wow, that's but it's still like it's still nodes in the scene that, that I could still understand. <clears throat> Going to Houdini, I was like, what? Well, wait, there's no my my scene is not like it it feels intangible because the scene that you're building is not the nodes are not objects, the nodes are operations. So it's more like you're writing code. Mm. You're 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 making a, a series of operations on mm -hmm. data. So if you're like, oh, I just want to select this object, it's like, well, this object doesn't really exist in this context because it's procedurally imported and then procedurally altered and modified mm -hmm. from with different operations. So I feel like that's the uh, the biggest hurdle when trying to learn Houdini is just trying to switch the thinking. Like Because if you open Houdini and you're thinking in Maya, mm -hmm. Maya thinking, <clears throat> you're going to do really weird things that are very inefficient. Mm -hmm. But if you try to take a step back and think, okay, this is more like a script. Like there's an input, like, okay, let's load an Olympic file and then let's get some geometry out of this and then mm -hmm. do some operations to it and export it to something else. If you think of it more that way, then once you've done this switch, mm -hmm. it becomes much easier and, and things become to make sense because the beauty of it is that all the building blocks in Houdini, they're all low level, <clears throat> uh, pretty simple. And across the entire application, they all kind of work the same. So mm -hmm. all the debugging techniques that you learn and you see, you can apply them when you're dealing with other things, uh, like with textures or mm -hmm. model or, or what. Everything starts to work the same or when you're running cloud simulations and everything, like it starts to feel like, oh, all these little building blocks, they're very easy to put together because they're simple. Mm -hmm. They're not like big black boxes that are incompatible. They're small mm -hmm. little pieces. So then you can say, oh, I can plug anything into anything oh that's amazing yeah yeah this is what i heard like in in houdini like you, you can um like normally if you go to maya or i guess max the same and in soft image also was in some situations the same not the eyes but the 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 other uh systems like if you have like solver that does the cloud simulation and another solver that does like a flip solver for the water and you want to crash water on the on the cloth and in many situations they not don't talk together they not interact together the the two solvers now that's something that in Houdini it's it's well integrated and all the solvers and everything can like talk each other and interact each other that's correct yeah yeah absolutely and that's the brilliant thing is that now you can because everything talks to each other you can use everything for everything you can think like i don't know so if you want to do something crazy like drive a skeleton with a fluid simulation like well you can i don't know why you would want to do that but yeah you can do that as extreme as this sounds but um for instance um on the game of thrones on the uh whites that you can see uh in my demo reel at the beginning <clears throat> um I had the little Lorenz meshes for all these whites, um, and they needed, yeah, that were uh, similar to the Maya that they had already done, mm -hmm. uh, little Lorenz characters, and they said, oh, now we would like to replace this with, yeah, the 700 uh, super high res rigs. I was like, oh, that's gonna be a big, uh, gonna be a big heavy thing, mm -hmm. and then it's like, oh, and then on top, can you have a little bit of cloth simulation on them, on all of them? <laughs> all these individual rigs and then also the guys that the dragon is stepping on can you also simulate them i was like wow if i was doing that in maya i would just i would just cry right now <laughs> but in houdini it was fairly simple i mean you know quote unquote simple. Oh, yeah I... <laughs> <laughs> it did take some time still <laughs> but being able to get treat these characters as geometry to transform mm -hmm. them and then feed that into a Houdini crowd node just to instance multiple rigs mm -hmm. and then 
transform the joints of each rig uh, based on the geometry that's being deformed and then driving the final rigs with that and then exporting that. Um, yeah, it was a really good um, learning moment for me into uh, using different parts of Houdini that you wouldn't think about using together to make this thing happen. Yeah, that's crazy. Yeah. It's too bad that in the final shots it was so dark that I think uh, a lot of people missed this shot. They're like, yeah. what? There was light? Like, yeah, the, it's just if you, you raise your brightness, you'll see them. Yeah, I, I saw this episode. Um, here in Japan, we don't have HBO, but you can watch it on... If you have Amazon Prime and you hire a Stars package or something like that, you, you can watch it one week later. Hmm or a few days later but you can watch it like almost and and I remember I, I, I've been following the, the series since uh, season one and <laughs> when this episode I was with my I watched it on here on the same screen and I'm using now like on the on the, my PC and <laughs> just touching all the color on my screen to and it was just and in this one supposedly it's HDR but pff, whatever it I mean it was tough to see this one. I, I don't know if the, the, the streaming on, on the Amazon Prime takes like the HDR thing, uh, activate or I don't know. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a technology that I'm not sure yet. But yeah, uh, to be honest, I didn't. I, I remember the episode when they, 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 they fall and uh, I remember all this, but yeah, not the detail that you can see here. Course. I yeah, I was glad when the image engine released these breakdowns. I thought, oh, okay, at least now I can show something. Oh, yeah, it was really nice. I, I think it is one of the most impressive episodes on all the this series, and yeah, it was a a bit of a like, yeah, the 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 because it was so dark. Maybe it was a lot of hard work that was missed from. <laughs> from the regular people like like yeah if you don't go and stop and try to to improve your light or something <laughs> and yeah um yeah and i this one you know i want to talk about this one and your of course your adventure it's, it's and, important and old studio because this is how i i found you this because this rig and because the um you know old studio have this um well, you know, but maybe the people on on listening this doesn't. Uh, this uh, pack on uh, Steam that you can get um, all these assets and the art and all the high resolution of the, all the short films that they did. And I mean, if you learning rigging, I think it's a really good uh, reference or source to to check out like some professional rigs and and uh yeah some of the most i don't know how to use the the word for how to describe this you got rick it's the <laughs> it's uh, like a ju juggernaut of the rigs or something like <laughs> and um yeah, it's hard to find the right the right yeah. word to describe it because people say like oh it's a complicated rig i say but it, it's not a complicated rig it's just a few hundred simple arm rigs so it's not complicated it's just it's busy it's massive so I have here one of these, but I'm just while we talk, I'm just gonna open, and you can you explain me before that this one is not uh, the the final one. This is kind of like the um, yeah the one that was compiled. Put on Steam. Yeah. I'm just gonna the open the animation. I don't dare to open the other one. <laughs> <laughs> no, please don't. <laughs> um, the way it was used in production at Oats is that. Uh, I had split the rig into seven different rigs, uh, one being the main bipedal rig that would run in real time that animators could just do the main motions of the character with. And then with a script, they could dynamically load and unload different parts of the rig so that they could always keep the rig fast, um, because that's important. Mm -hmm. Even when there's a lot of limbs, it still needs to be fast. But uh, the one that was uploaded to Steam is basically all these modules together and then constrained and then saved as one scene. So that scene that you open is, well, seven times more heavy than yeah, I how have, it would be in production. I have here the numbers. Let me check. The one opening, it's 400 megabytes, the rig. 
and the render one it's uh, close to 600 megabytes it's my ask by the way it's not my binary it's almost there <laughs> yeah okay it's a we were talking about uh, the uh, seemingly impossible tasks that <coughs> arrive sometime i think the cycle trig was definitely a good example where it's like well we are going to make this creature with hundreds of limbs and we would like to start animating in two weeks. So, Eric, how do you feel about that? <laughs> Yikes. <laughs> oh, look, at that. look at that, how it loads. It's, it, you can see the loading. It's... Yeah, it, it's crazy that you, you, you say yes. <laughs> yes. Well, some, somebody has to do it, otherwise it's impossible. Yeah. But look at that. I mean, it's not that heavy. I mean, I feel like... Yeah, I mean, of course... that's, that's the end. The animation rig, I have uh, applied procedural uh, cutout mesh. Uh, that's what I've been doing for all my rigs, basically, where I take the whole geometry and I look at all the points and see like which joint has the most influence on this point, and then I generate a cutout mesh out of that. That's as representative as possible as the skinned one. Yeah. <laughs> that's nice. I mean, that's a. I cannot even to to make it planning for this rig. How, how, where, where do you start? How how do you how do you do you take this and <laughs> and just start placing? Okay, here is my first joint, or I don't know how you rig this. I guess you have your own uh, rigging system, and probably modular yeah. one. I guess for the oh. amount of limbs. <laughs> I have not made a rig by hand in more than ten years. Um, I don't think rigging by hand is. Look realistic that. anymore because yeah now there's now expectations that you need to make really big complex rigs and then you don't have any time to do it so if you try to rig this by hand then you'll be rigging for a long time um <clears throat> but the way it was approached is that thankfully because it was at all studios it was a very small team and we all kind of sat together and you know tried to plan this ahead a little bit but um Basically, I provided uh, Ian Spriggs, the modeler of the Zygote, with um, some rig limbs. I think, I don't remember how many, like a few, a few bodies and a few arms. And then he used that to kind of do some of the initial placement of the character. Yeah. And then I extracted the joint positions from these original limbs. So at least I didn't have to place joints for everything yeah. uh, which was good like especially for the hands like yeah. the hands i didn't have to do like some of them were modeled like model modeled so i had to place joints in them but most of them i was able to reuse the joint position from the rig that i supplied the modeler so that's that's been very helpful uh, yeah, I, I it, and that's really, and I mean, this is something I, I, I sometimes uh, also think that in some situations is, it's really wise to have like this pre-rig part to conceptualize something and um, later uh, apply it. But here is brilliant. I mean, it's, I think it's the only way that you can go to to have it on the time that you had to to do it. Just like to to have something that when you get the model already have all the placement or many of the placement ready f to you to use because if not you can i mean you can go crazy i mean it's a, <laughs> look at this it's it, it, a whole hun hundreds of fingers just in one hand and well i guess this is one hand <laughs> yeah <laughs> and i was trying to um root bodies do you remember by any chance where is your you know this is log somewhere uh, where is your joints? But anyway, don't worry. It's... Um, yeah, that's the GNT group. That's the joint group. And you see the top groups that you see, the root groups. That's the root groups of each of the original rigs. Mm, I see. So this one, the top one, Zygote, that's the main bipedal rig that all the other rigs are loaded onto. Uh, in this particular scene, they're constrained onto it. But yeah, that's the base rig that you can animate in real time just to do the overall motions of the character, which, <clears throat> you know, you, you, that's what I delivered them um, at the beginning, just to start, like, right away blocking shots without having to wait for me to rig a million hands. So, yeah, you see this this rig is a lot simpler, so it kind of 
of my performance. Mm, um, I see. So this is probably the main like rig used by the animators, let's say. Yeah. And then, and then all the rigs after that, they're constrained on that as an additional layer. So they contain like all the fingers and the extra hands and all the extra little moving pieces. That's great. And that that allowed the animators to load only, you know, the left leg and work on that so that it would still be real time. Um, <clears throat> I think it's really nice. I mean, I, I think I'm going to use this model to test uh, like new riggers on the studio. So just going <laughs> to, <laughs> yeah, yeah, this, uh, just a little test on the, no, I, I, I don't do that thing, but <laughs> it can be just to see the face. <laughs> Yeah, and be like, oh yeah, we we're gonna still modify the model, but also, yeah, yeah. it would be nice if like tomorrow we can oh. have something to start with. I, I just realized there's some pennies with rig also. Hey, cool. Yes. <laughs> there's uh, if you go at the back of the top of like the head, yeah, at the back. There's also some butt controllers. Oh yeah, I yeah. see. Yeah, the there's butt control. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Ooh, there's also yeah. butt. Butt control. Um, yeah. And these you can kind of rotate to kind of make some bounce on the butts. <laughs> uh, yeah, there's some breast controllers as well. Uh, they, all the oh, yeah. all the body parts are rigged on that mm, thing. Let's see. Uh, what is this? It was at the end. I think I saw... Yeah, 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 yeah. Here, here, here. Yeah. So you see that's the different modules that... So they could load these independently to uh, keep performance. So that, these individual modules, they were still pretty fast. Um, uh, which is good and important yeah that's amazing and and i i don't know who did the animation but man it's it's great and and the animator i mean i think the rig must be difficult to do but animate the rig with all that many limbs also it's even if you use distribute like this um i mean it's a it's a daunting task it's yeah <laughs> it's uh or maybe yeah, there was five animators uh, animating the zygote on these shots. So it's f okay. So it's five animators that re I mean animated this the same shot like p by parts or or it was just <coughs> no, each animator one anim But yeah, but then animators could also kind of yeah I think. help each other out. Be like, oh, I'll, I'll animate your fingers or something like that. Uh, that's. Uh... It's like uh, distribute rendering, but distribute animation and just take one yeah. one shot and do little parts. Yeah, and I wish I knew Houdini at the time because I would have done some procedural jiggling and like, I feel like they would have, if I was doing this now, there would definitely be a big old Houdini pass on top. They would be doing um, a lot of these dangling things. Yeah. It, uh, but it's really great and i mean it's it's hard to say if with all this detail on the movement i i, I probably will add some, like quality but not too many people will know the difference i think in terms of yeah like because it's did you even notice the muscle deformation in the rig no <laughs> there is no way there, there, there is but i mean uh, the muscle layer of this was like done in a few hours. Um, <laughs> basically, it was a hand. <laughs> the done was like, they were like, oh my God. Eric, do you think we can have some kind of like muscles in this rig? But, well, I mean, delivery is tomorrow. I mean, this is a bit, there's not a lot of time, but let's, I'll see what I can do. <laughs> so, I um, basically, what I put on most of the like, at least the biceps on all of the limbs mm -hmm. um, to try to uh, fake muscle deformations. What I did is that I applied the delta mush on the bulge of the bicep mm -hmm. that would get triggered when the arm uh, extends. Mm -hmm. So basically, as the arm extends, it would kind of reduce the detail of the muscle geometry. And then when it compresses, it would bring it back. And that kind of created the illusion that there's a muscle bulge in there. I thought this was a very efficient, very cheap fake muscle. I was like, well, it's better than nothing. It, now when the, when the arm bends, you see the bicep bulge. That's, that's already better than just normal skinning. So that's good. Yeah, it's amazing. I mean, it... 
Yeah, you must have some. I mean, had some nightmares or dreams on the when while you you was doing this like fingers or. <laughs> yeah, that means that was so much fun when you get a, a challenge like this where people are saying like, oh, you know, is it even possible? It's like. I'm thinking like, ooh, is it even possible? I don't know. I want to find out. So uh, I was very excited to work on that. That was cool. And 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 I remember I, I was checking all the also this one, and you have here this kind of system also to make like a this jiggling yeah. thing that that is not that the same that you put on Zigot, no? This is no. Uh, this is just a nerve strip that's added as a deformer in the skin cluster. So that's also another like cheap solution for like. Because, you know, this is just a, a nerve strip that gets deformed. Um, that means that animators were able to kind of fake some muscle jiggling and mm. deformation as, as needed. And it's still, you know, you're, you're manipulating the muscles right now and, you know, it's not as slow as real muscles. Yeah, it, this is the render version, by the way. So yeah. it's, it's a bit slower. But it's really nice. And the, the, the topology is really high also. It's really cool. This one, I, 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 I was hoping some of these projects will become like a feature length, but I, I, I read mm. somewhere the with a Blue Camp interview that no, the goal was just to do this, like to, to do the, the the little shorts that was not not meant to be like a feature film. No, no, it was, and that's still the goal, and I think that's. As far as I can talk about the current state of this project, because it's still ongoing. Oh, really? So maybe we see someday one of these projects in a future film. That's great. Yeah. That's great. I, I remember, you know, you know, the only, I, I was, I mean, with Zigot, it's really impressive. And the, I, I'm, I don't follow the... Um, the TV series, the uh, how it's called, Stranger Things. But do you saw the demo reel from um, uh, Rodeo? The the breakdown of the rig they did did. I don't think I have. This one, it's it's also I I think in like character monster wise thing. I think your C God and later this one that is much newer. It's probably my top two like rigs that I I I I. I I was like mesmerized. How? Uh, let me. Let me. Um... Yeah, I think I've. I think I've seen it. I think it's Rodeo VFX. Um, Rodeo VFX. Oh, FX, not VFX. Do, do you? Have you seen it? Um, yeah, I think so. It is one. Yeah. yeah. What? Wait. But that's not that many limbs. That's not Zygote level of limbs. Yeah, exactly. It's <laughs> but not it does. A... It, I kind of remember this thing kind of transforms a little bit, like it yeah. kind of changes shape and everything. So that's another layer of complexity, of course. That's also challenging. Yes, exactly. That that's it. Um, well, I don't know what is the 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 breakdown, but if I find it, I will add it on the notes on the on the on the video pod on YouTube. But yeah, it's quite amazing also. But yeah, of course, the number of limbs is not that that much. Oh, yeah. But you remember me, your your rig, I guess, like this non-form thing. And also, of course, this like, uh, did, did you work on the, um, when you was on Image Engine on the engine on the, uh, the, the thing and then the, the remake that they did? Young thing, you know, the young character thing. No, no, um, because I I wasn't working at the Image Engine at that time. Yeah, that was also really really impressive. Yeah, and it was in yeah Image Engine, they really good. I mean, I had also like one one time a few years ago the chance to to work there, but it didn't I I di I didn't go, and I kind of regret now. Oh <laughs> mm. yeah, that's yeah. Image Engine like, was definitely a good place to work for. Yeah, I heard all, yeah, all good words there. It was really, it's still like a really nice place to work there. I heard one of the best probably in, in Vancouver is what, at least for, for my friends, what they told me. Uh, they, they told me, like, why you didn't take it? I say, well, I don't know. 
<laughs> anyway, um, yeah, it's really cool. And then after all these shorts, you work at also on the um, um, on the short film for uh, Adam, the the project yeah. done with Unity. Have you been involved? You did all the riggings, and also I remember the um, on this project. This was this technology where the face was like a row scan thing, like. Uh, like some of the facial animation for the human characters was, like yeah, there was facial capture involved. Yeah. Uh, do, do you do you, I mean, do you work on that part also, or which which part do you work there? How oh, was? <coughs> no, I mean, um, I was delivered um, facial capture face geometry, and I just integrated it into the rigs. Mm. So I wasn't involved in the capturing and the overall facial mocap part. Mm-hmm. That's really cool. Um, what do you think about this technology? Like the uh, because I I saw s many times when they they won't, they do the digital doubles, and they do all, all this uh, like complex, especially when it's like digital double, like pure double, like not like um, the converse like Hulk or something that obviously you need to 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 create the art, no? But the when it's pure digital double and they do all these rigs to recreate in, in this scanning system, it's like you you can you don't need to rig and like quotes there, but it's more like raw data of the animation and you get a really like realistic non like uncanny valley kind of facial, no? Or Yeah. Uh for the Adam ones there was the facial capture and then I added like a simple face rig on top so that animators could oh. add some extra things as needed, kind of tweak the performance as needed. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, yeah, facial capture is, is definitely evolving a lot. I'm thinking like, oh no, all the interesting stuff I want to talk about is all uh -huh. ND covered, yeah. all, this, all this amazing technology, but I can talk about it. Yeah, but yeah, I think we will see. I think especially in terms of capturing reality it's it's mm, like I, I i saw like last five years ten, like f big difference like maybe 10 years ago to to now it's like huge but five years from now uh it's been like a lot of like progression on the capturing everything like it's it's becoming more uh like before like 3d scanning and all these, uh, I think it's this. Uh, I think now this um, was yesterday or th this week was a cubic motion was also acquired by by Epic Games. Before mm -hmm. it was trilateral, and now the 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 other company does the, all the motion capture for the demos that it was doing, like in a uh, few like two, two one two years ago. I don't know if you saw that demos with the they that they have the digital mic and they they do the. I don't remember the game they did the ah the girl with the blue, blue yeah I don't remember the, it was really impressive but they they still like like the, the capturing the like hum, like real actors and 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 transporting In real time. it yeah well yeah exactly not real but the performance is real time later so they they capture everything they have someone with the suit and the and the facial um camera to to capture and they can play. I mean, it's not playback. It's cap like performance. It's real time. That's that's crazy. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's um. Yeah, my my thought here is like. This technology maybe in the future and not so long. It's gonna be like more and more affordable. We will see like digital doubles and if you can get the person, the actor, to 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 process like to scan and to to set the like the data that you need to 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 use it on the system it's going to be much more like like mainstream like uh, and what is going to become like expensive it's going to be when you do like things like pixar styles or more like something that you cannot grab it from the reality and and bring back to to the digital world Especially with how machine learning is getting introduced for these things to try to, you know, learn how all these real things are supposed to look 
yeah. and all these things are getting more and more experience and f in filling the gaps. Um, yeah, I think for facial capture, that's also going to make a, yeah. a big difference. Yeah, I think it's going to, like, in, in general, not only for, for uh, like, rigging or, ca uh, like, facial capture or anything, but, um, like, with, who is this people? The um, uh, uh, Mega Scans, I think it's the the company also that, and Quicksilver. The, 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 these people, it's like, I mean, it's revolution in the. I mean, before, like, maybe yeah, like this ten years ago, the uh, if you do something hyper realistic, it was the expensive thing to do. It's m way more like hard, and now it's. If you do hyper realistic, it's becoming the the easiest quotes there. Of course, it's not easy, but easier than maybe doing something really like still eyes in in uh, let's say when you talk like uh, animation movies like uh, Disney Pixar's or uh, uh, this uh, I don't remember the name now. The the the, the company does the the Speakable Me and the Minions and so on. Like this like triple A feature film animation studios I th and then you see some la someone at like doing maybe a little short or a little piece that it can reach this quality of hyper realism I'm not talking about like in general like maybe some like landscape or something like this uh, it's it's w like the balance it's changing from maybe one to another I don't know it's just like thinking in, in global terms of animation and CG. I think so. Because like as we get more uh, technology, how you can now uh, you know, use a million machines in the cloud to mm. process anything you want. Like anything that's based on analyzing data to replicate things that exist, it's becoming easier. Mm. But doing stylized things, it's even if you have a million computers, mm -hmm. you can't have them do creative, like, oh, let's make this stylized thing. I mean, I'm thinking eventually we'll reach that point where mm -hmm. we'll just be, oh, AI, just, we want stylized things that looks a little bit like this and a little bit like this, and here's the script for the story, and you go ahead. Yeah. You want a movie. Yeah, that's gonna be scary. It's gonna be instead of Netflix, AI Flix, where you you have your account, and I want to see a movie with cowboys and species, but it's a dinosaur. Yeah, I like the dinosaur, but I want pink dinosaur and, but yeah, but in Pixar style. But no, not that one. But the other movie, <laughs> it's gonna process for you the movie, <laughs> and poof, and I want a happy ending, and then you watch your movie, <laughs> maybe. I don't know. Yeah, yeah. I don't know if it's gonna be fun for us that we work in this industry. Uh, I think at this point, when we get replaced <laughs> by AI, everybody else will have also, so we won't be alone. Yeah, maybe. Uh, we'll see. Um, yeah, it's really, really cool. And the other thing I I was um, just jumping under a reel and. I hope you don't mind. I ask you like very random questions, but you did this um, crowd system for um, it was um, the Hobbit or yeah yeah. Can can you talk a little bit about this this system and how you did this? Yeah, that was a uh, that was a lot of fun. This was definitely one of those uh, seemingly impossible things and it's really funny how uh, all this task happened um, this is an army manager this is a crowd previous tool that I made and basically on my first week at Weta um, the week where I started mm -hmm. my supervisor was not returned from vacation yet so technically I didn't really have tasks so I thought like oh I'll try to make myself useful so I went to one of the guys in the department in the army department saying like oh is there maybe a small task I can pick up just so I can, you know, do something while I wait for my real tasks? And they're like, oh yeah, the previous department, they want a little script to project characters on the ground surface and make them, you know, walk on there. 
And I thought, oh, that simple recasting task, that's going to take me half an hour. No problem. Let me do it. I'll do it. And then I did that. And then they're like, oh, that's really nice. Now, do you think we can also have this, um, have uh, 40,000 characters and run in real time on the virtual set so that Peter Jackson can use the virtual camera and go around the armies? And can we do this in the next two weeks? I thought, oh, I mean, this sounds very difficult, but we can try. <laughs> <laughs> and then after that, it was like, oh, can we use this tool to plan the big, big army battles at the end, like have some kind of schematic view where you just have some, uh, oh, this block of this army formation is going there, and then it's going to be in this shape, and then it's going to crash in here. Mm. And basically, from my first week to a year later, I was still working on this task, and that's the only task I was working on. So this, this oh, can you make a little script that projects characters on the ground? It, like, it kept... They, they were really enjoying it. They're like, oh, this is great. Do you think we can add this? And that's how always how you know, things happen. There's always something more you can do. Like, oh, can you have like some pathfinding maybe? Like that the agents <laughs> avoid them still? It's like, I mean, can I can be some basic A star and... Yeah, and all this and, uh, was for previous. This was uh, for previous, yeah. That's, but it's a lot. I mean, it, then... So, but it's amazing. I mean, the the quality of the previous it's crazy, and you can run it on on how, how was working the the real time thing. It's it's like in game engine or something like. Yes. Uh, and that's 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 where it goes into the ND territory. That's you know using what as hardware oh, and doing oh, magic. Oh, sorry. Okay, uh, I understand. <laughs> but uh, yes, yes, it was some yeah, beautiful well, guess... hardware rendering, yeah. and uh, yeah, fun fact. Uh, some shots there was not enough time to do full massive sims so they just used the army manager agents and put that in the final movie <laughs> so it was not previous it was final <laughs> at the end and also the funny part is because army manager was only existing in the gpu it was just uh you know it was not ge generate geometry for rendering purpose or anything it was just dumped in the gpu for previous purpose mm -hmm. so to put this into the final movie is a play blast. So that means that there's play blast in the final movie. Like some of the shots, like the, the wide shot that you see where the army is very far, uh... Uh, the final render, yeah, in this shot, this is a play blast. Like the eight, all the army stuff, uh... it's a play blast that was comped into the final shot, which I find is it's really funny that there's a play blast in the final movie. But it's, I mean, I... I but it's a, it's a fancy weather viewport playlist, so it looks better than yeah. your average playlist. But still, it's funny that it's still, to create these images that you see, I clicked on the playlist button and made a playlist and sent that to comp to my yeah. put in the show. But it's great. I mean, I, I think this is one of the things that, um, especially on, on VFX, and again, when was not the digital era of VFX that was more like uh, like practical effects and uh, camera tricks and things like that it that was the the way to go it's not like to do it, it it's always like if it looks like it's good enough now sometimes I feel in on VFX when I see the breakdowns on the movies they they do like and they put like the little nail that breaks when he hits the the asteroid and and explodes the planet and but the nail on the one i mean it goes like very very like and you, you think you really need to do that i mean i understand yeah, I it's going to be an imax so maybe you see details and but i think it's more for a marketing purpose i think studios are they're seeing these very fancy breakdowns and they're like oh to be a real studio, you need to have fancy breakdowns. Mm -hmm. And I've, I've seen that. I, I've seen shots where like, it's character in the background that doesn't mm. even look good because it's not even well animated. But in the breakdown, they're like, oh, look, we model the skeleton and the muscles and the nervous system. Oh, yeah. and, and like, but I... why though? You spend a lot of time doing this and this doesn't help the final shot in mm. any way. 
So the only purpose of all this breakdown stuff is just to make cool looking breakdowns because everybody wants to have cool looking breakdowns because people don't want to, yeah. I don't know. I don't, people are ashamed of the movie magic. It's like, we're, we're, I think, yeah, I think we might be getting lost here where people are getting too focused on, Yeah. oh, but look at this fancy breakdown. We have model like the intestines. It's like, well, why? <laughs> They're not in the simulation. We don't need them. Like, well, why is there geometry there? Well, this is not even, on the final render, this makes zero difference. Yeah, I because it's not in the simulation. I'm not. I'm not gonna lie, lie you. I I had this conversation with a friend. I don't. So. Uh, but I don't remember who. But I remember the conversation. Like talking like, oh, this. Uh, oh, maybe I remember now. I'm not gonna say it, but it, same situation. I asked, oh, you did this nice muscle thing. I see the breakdown and. No, the, the, the muscle thing was finished after the project was finished. We just added on the breakdown to make some advertisement thing. But the yeah, project was finished finish and delivered before the, 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 <laughs> the muscle system was in place to, to do it. And it was like in, yeah, I think, yeah, it was like maybe eight years ago. And, and it was like soft image thing on ice. And it was like, wow. And then uh, when I asked my friend, wow, I said, no, we finish later that. <laughs> and yeah, so in that's first hand, and probably there's many situations like that, you say, like. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I, I've seen it. I've seen it. So it's like, it's not urban legend, it's real. <laughs> oh, it's true. And you know, in a way, you can see it's kind of. Another aspect of movie magic is marketing movie magic. That, <laughs> oh, we make this illusion that there is a muscle system and this illusion that it's not shot modeling in every shot. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm pretty sure, yeah, this it's it's happening. Yeah. The um yeah, I did yeah. Yeah, and I don't want to get in on the shot sculpting and fixing because <laughs> that's a, a new world of like movie magic. It's the shot sculpting phase and <laughs> on many shows. Yeah, but sometimes you know there's yeah so many things. So many times it's oh look at this shot. It's a it's a one-off shot. It's so simple. Oh, which why don't just let's just shot modeling it. This is gonna take. It's mm -hmm. not gonna take a lot of time to do it. Like no no no, we need to model the skeleton and then yeah model the nervous system like, wh wh why yeah yeah i think i i was working in a here in japan in a it was a movie that was canceled uh and i was doing like um i think it was few uh, four or five months i was doing like uh mainly uh, character effects, cloth and hair simulation, and then um, shot sculpting. And I, to be honest, I really like to do shot sculpting. I, I enjoy the process of getting in the zone and just sculpting, especially cloth. I, I, I hate when I need to fix hair, the crossing in the cloth and things like that. Hair is horrible to, to fix, but cloth, it's something I really enjoy it. And in some situations, I remember doing shots like where the character needs to grab from the back the other character and pull from the the shirt and it was not i mean how are you gonna simulate that it explodes and i mean <laughs> you know even if you prepare and do switches between frames to from this to this goal target and and then there are like after doing tests and tests and for this one like and we was doing like batching the 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 system on on the on the studio is it's really great and you can set batches of configurations and send it to the farm and you get like a play blast with a nice render of different uh, like results and you choose pick and choose which one is better and you you fine tune from there and in some point i just yeah fuck it <laughs> just <laughs> doing all the uh all the frames frame by frame and then when i go to dailies and say oh do we simulate this and it's 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 going super nice and the pool and doesn't intersect how you do it well i just do it with frame by frame <laughs> it was like 
very fast, like maybe second or something, like 20 frames or something like that. But it worked really well, and yeah, I think it's also magic of ah, simulation. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I feel like it's it's very easy to get stuck on a technological idea, like oh, <clears throat> this needs to be a simulation. Oh, it's not working. Oh, but it needs to be a simulation. So let's make it work. Yeah. But sometimes it's much easier to take a step back and think, well. Maybe there's a simpler way to do this. Maybe there's a way we can just make this shot happen. Yeah, and it's mo much more fun. I have to say, I I, I rather prefer to to go by hand sometimes that uh, just wait and try different <laughs> values and try different things and wait and you know. Do, how do you do? You, I mean, for for you, how how is simulation? I mean, do you, do you like to to play with? Simulation, or do you do you prefer more like uh, direct, uh, like a proceduralism to or direct control? I'm not sure. Do you mean for like yeah. the CFX work that I've done? Yeah, or? for instance, um, sometimes when it's for instance, if you work on Houdini, you can maybe do something that it's simulated, but it's it's more like procedural, like yes, where you that's you definitely. Where you go more like, let's say, I don't know how to say, like, you don't rely fully on the on the physics simulation of the uh, of the the, the the solver that you're using, but more like maybe something that looks like it's simulated, but indeed it's under the hood. It's just uh, like rig it, like yeah, and you you can absolutely. Um, I think that's. One of the things we were talking earlier about how all the little Houdini building blocks talk to each other, mm -hmm. that's definitely um, very useful to have like, oh, there's the real physically accurate simulation and then it gets fed into another process that does something creative on top to fix some issues or make something look better instead of tweaking the physical simulation until it does something that's physically impossible, for instance, when they're like, oh, they, we want this to look like this and be physically accurate. And thinking, well, what you're asking is not physically accurate, so how is that? Yeah. So it needs to feel like it's been made physically accurate, but that's why it's very useful to be able to kind of split it into different pieces, have some parts that are sent with physical accuracy, some parts that are same with more like procedural things mm. to and then put them together. I found that, that was a very good thing in Houdini. Like for instance, um, on the whites on Game of Thrones, mm -hmm. like, you know, there's 700 whites out there climbing on the dragon there. And yeah, at some point they're like, oh, it would be nice if their little loin plots were plot simulations. And I thought, well, that's 700 clot simulations. I mean, there's more than one clot per character, so it's more like, you know, mm. a few thousands clot simulations per shot. And yeah, the clock is taking me to deliver this. So it's another case of, oh, let's find a cheap solution that works. So for these clots, um, I use the chop lag on some of the geometry that's clot mm -hmm. as a and then I made a little fall off. So basically, the end of the clothing, basically it went from like the outer edges of the clothing towards the middle of the character, and the outer section of the clothing would lag, have like a, mm. yeah, a lag, so lag big... more than closer to the body. So that made the illusion that there's some follow through in the clot. And that, I mean, that ran in real time, and that's, mm. that's good because doing actual, you know, at first we're thinking, well, we could feed all these characters and then extract the clot and plug it into Vellum and, you know, that will totally work. But then then it's a few thousands simulations per mm -hmm. shot to do in no time. So that's that's uh, that's always scary. Mm -hmm. But the sim because these characters are so small and everything is motion blur and it's moving fast, and that maybe we'll just try something simple and cheap. And the simple and cheap thing often yeah. works in movie magic. Yeah, this is, I mean, it works perfectly. I mean, this is, <laughs> look at that. It, it, 
playing that. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> now that I see, like, yeah, it works perfectly, but some of, yeah. Yeah, obviously someone is gonna say, this is not realistic. Yeah, sure. The people yeah, is being is, thrown on is, I mean, a like huge a dragon. Time. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Is what I <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you, yeah, you, you have a uh, reference footage for real dragons. I will use it as a <laughs> to make it more realistic. <laughs> but yeah, it's amazing. It's really nice. This, I mean, in it, 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 it's very. I mean, to see all the little guys jumping around and. And you can see the guys that he's walking on to, the little piles of guys that get squished. Yeah, this is, this is, yeah. it's very satisfying to see all this detail. By the way, the, the, the way that you edit your demo, it's really nice because it goes perfect on the direction and <laughs> everything mm. looks like, what, <laughs> the dragon be convert like to... Yeah. This comes from animation experience, you know, this animation <laughs> principles of like uh, action lines and things like that that I try to apply yeah. into the real as well. Yeah, it's really great. I, I was realizing because I'm going back and forward a few times already on your on your reel now and I realized that you, you, you nailing the, the, the con continuity on the shot. <laughs> That's great. That's really cool. And now you, you, you're working on on EA, but also you told me that you keep doing uh, rigs on your um, on your side, like m like more like a, as a personal thing or like like doing like yeah. little. Yeah, when some friends are making short films or something, like oh, can you have a little rig or something? Uh, this is great. I try to help out just to get. Don't say yeah, it keep too up to date. Don't say it too loud. Maybe it's dangerous. <laughs> 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 but yeah, this is, and also you told me that uh, you you doing also some uh, like mentoring some some people, some friends that are um, like asking you some sometimes like you you s did some like uh, train some people, but yeah yeah uh, there's some students around the world that have uh, reached out to me for like helping them look at their reel and you know prepare their reel for their first job and things like that. So yeah, if you're at school learning rigging and yeah, I don't know, you look at your reel and wondering, hmm, is my rig ready for the industry? You can always just like shoot this. me an email and you know. That's cool. And do do I, you like like teaching or do you do you do you enjoy how how do you feel like about the teaching rigging? It's uh, uh, I think it's it's hard to teach. Uh, on, uh, less for my experience. Yeah, it's it's definitely hard, especially like, there isn't much. Um, at least when I was teaching, there wasn't rigging schools. It was more, you know, generalist schools. So mm -hmm. when you go teach a rigging class, there's ninety percent of the class that thinks, "Oh God, rigging! I don't want to learn about that. Rigging is stupid." <laughs> I, but then there's like the ten percent are like, ooh, rigging, that sounds like fun. So yeah, that can be a bit challenging. But uh no yeah, I haven't been teaching in a while. So I try to just help out where I can by answering people's questions. But uh yeah, I just found that life is so busy these days that I don't I don't find I have time to do anything. I have like a a huge to-do list. I have some machine learning books that need to be read and some personal projects to develop and some ideas to test with. Oh. But there's not enough time. There's yeah. never enough time. I feel you. I feel you there. I, uh, yeah, same from here. Yeah. It's, um, yeah, it's too much ideas and too little time. And yeah, especially uh, lately for me, if, uh, I try sometimes to do too much, and, and and you do everything little by little, but it's it's painful to to see that advances. Like one year pass, and oh no, this project it's just a little, a little advance here, or just a little step there, and um, yeah, it's um, yeah, sometimes it's hard to so many th 
fun things to do if you that <laughs> it's hard to choose <laughs> that's a good problem to have yeah absolutely <laughs> it's a great problem to have but well, yeah it's still a problem and um I would like to ask you that do you have any for for instance for people who is interested in becoming a rigger or uh it's uh, already starting as a rigger some like advice uh or yeah some i guess advice is a word for for the, being a rigger yeah yeah um i think the most important uh skill a rigger can have uh especially nowadays is being adaptable um i find like a lot of people they learn rigging and they learn like a technique or a software or a programming language they, they learn a very specific skill and they hold on to it they're like oh i'm a maya rigger i do rigs in maya and that's that's what i do and i feel like because the industry is always changing so much and there's always new software and new technologies and new things that if you get stuck on the technology that you're using, like it's very easy to fall behind. Mm -hmm. And you know, as I was saying earlier, like when you get presented with a challenge that has a, that requires a skill that you don't have, it's very scary because you think, well, but I know what I'm doing with the software I have. If I go to this new software, I won't know what I'm doing. I'll be, you know, I'll, I'll be a beginner again. Mm -hmm. And it's, I think it's hard for the ego to accept this, that, okay, well, yeah, well, the first time you open the new software, you're going to be, like, back to, you know, but all your experience is going to help you learn, you know, faster the new software. Mm -hmm. And I think it's definitely uh, the thing that has helped me the most in my career is just thinking, like, okay, yeah, I don't mind. If there's a new operating system a new software a new programming language I like i will just use whatever is the best thing to use for this particular task at this particular time and that's kind of free it's like oh but we're writing all this stuff in c sharp do you know c sharp like oh well not yet but and then i've learned it and then now i do and then that's yeah that's very great. useful yeah that's a great way to go like in Definitely, this is something that, um, um, for instance, I I, I started uh, like, well, I started with 3ds, but let's say uh, when I start rigging more seriously or like a professional rigger, I did it with Softimage, and um, obviously now I uh, I'm not using Softimage anymore. Um, I jump it to to Maya, and it doesn't. It's not like you 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 start from zero it's a beginner or something no you your the skill set as a rigger is it's part it's knowing the software knowing the framework where you work on like how it works the technology that you're using to do the rigs that's one part that you need to relearn but the the bigger part for me is the experience to have to make the rigging to solve the problems and to 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 uh, create the this like um let's say the formation and also the manipulation rigs and everything it's not something that you lose if you learning technology it's just add and when you um learn from different softwares and different w different ways to solve the problems you can enrich your process on that and it, it at least for my experience um talking with other colleagues that for instance they, they learn reading in Maya they still do it in Maya they, they only think the Maya way and uh, I had like the experience with another application then now move to Maya and uh, of course you need to relearn some some stuff because it doesn't apply one to one but at the same time uh, you find new ways to do something because you, you didn't see the same way that the other people see the things and if you add more and more to this, uh, like tool set of or skill set, I will say, it becomes easier and it becomes like a, it's like a snowball or I don't know how to say here. In, I think in Japanese it will be katamari. It's like a, a big ball that you add, <laughs> attach stuff, right? and you you can keep growing that that ball. You know, let's say, and I I think you you are a perfect example here. You you touch all the 
almost all the softwares that it's uh, in the market in terms of DCC and you do also all the specialities that becomes like a character TD let's say that's rigor character effects and all the all the things in between Yeah, you're right. Especially you know, you're saying that when you're learning new softwares and new techniques, the, the principles are the same. But when you're learning new techniques and new softwares, you're seeing what's different, but also what's common, and it like it enlightens your overall understanding on how all of these things work, and that makes things everything becomes simpler. So it's all it's. Everything is as scary as at the beginning when you open the software for the first time. And you're like, "Oh wow, what did I do? This is so foreign." <laughs> yeah. But you know, you just you just gotta go through it, and then it becomes simpler. And the more you do it, the easier it becomes. And at some point, you know, you'll be like, "Oh, what? You want me to work in this new software I've never heard of? Okay, well, I, I'm not afraid." Yeah. Yeah. For me, the the only disadvantage, and that's. Uh it's after you jump from software to software you're not happy with any of them like in terms of because you like one thing from one the other thing from the other the, the you know you did so it start to everything has its own great things but also bad things or things that you like and things that you don't like and probably at least for me it's like i don't when I was working only with one software and I was kind of like ignorant in my little world, I was super happy with the software. It's the best. Now when you start learning more softwares, it's like, yeah, I, I don't like even the old one because I know that it has a lot of also uh, problems and things that I don't like. I'm comfortable with the new one, but still missing parts from the old one and so on. And uh, as I keep adding and trying to learn other stuff, I start feeling like I like this one and now yeah I start little by little like learning a little bit of Blender because I was thinking I want to, to learn more software just for the sake of learning more and uh, well Blender is the free one and it's kind of trendy now so and it has really interesting things uh, but also like some other that it's like a little scary or not scary but too different so and it, it has the good and the bad no like when you you learn but yeah now I wish I I can mix and match all the software and make my own so <laughs> perfect but it's not possible I guess <laughs> how do you feel about that how how is your your feelings you 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 started I think in Max and Maya Houdini yeah, I started Max and then Maya. I helped writing some tools in uh, XSI a little bit. Oh, yeah. And then. Yeah, and then to Houdini. Um, and of course, some preparatory softwares along the way. Mm. Secret softwares, of course. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, you're saying like, oh, you're taking all these ideas from seeing all these different features and things like, oh, I just want to make my own. I wish I could pull out the Epic 3D, the 3D application that I had started writing. Oh. Uh, because, um, yeah, that was about 10 years ago. I, I was kind of starting out in Python. Like I was coming from a Max script and C sharp and a little bit of C++, but then, yeah, I was moving to Maya and Python and thought like, oh, okay, I, I really need to learn Python now, so I need to give myself some challenges. Mm -hmm. And then I found that that's a good way to, to learn to, having like a specific target, like, oh, I want to do this and think of it as a deliverable that you're not allowed to fail. So when you, you get blocked, you force yourself to, to learn how to get unblocked. So at some point in Python, I was starting to write little video games. And then at some point I thought, oh, I should do something with 3D graphics, something something simple, like a simple 3D game. And then I started looking into uh, using OpenGL from Python. Mm -hmm. And then I started doing some basic 3D stuff. And I thought, 
oh, but at this point, maybe I should just write a 3D application. That would be fun. <laughs> Uh, I don't know, your definition of fun, it's uh, interesting at least. <laughs> but yeah, this is, yeah, I, I have ex colleague that he did the same, he did like a physics simulator, yeah, because he was bored and was not too much task to do and started to code in like uh, something that was like really amazing it was no i just born just doing this whatever like if he was doodling something on the napkin just for kill the time <laughs> it was like my god <laughs> oh yeah that's um so did do you do you but you didn't continue the how how was the did the project die or yeah you know it's one of these projects that you you end up not having enough time and then it slowly uh, fades back into time and you forget about it like oh yeah that's right i started writing this at some point yeah, that's but then now you know it's been so many years that all this code that's that's a good feeling when you look at old code and you think oh the person who wrote that doesn't know anything oh but that's me a few years ago oh that's that means i i've i've grown since then so that's that's always good to look back a few years and think okay is my code today a lot better than the code from a few years ago? Yes. Yeah. Okay. That's 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 yeah. good. We're moving forward. Yeah. Yeah. That's. But that... I might do one again. Just. Well, I'm. I'll just let me know when it's the beta ready. I will jump also to learn that one. <laughs> and that was funny because yeah, when I was making Epic 3D, I was still a 3D Studio Max guy, and I was just starting to learn Maya. Mm -hmm. And I was looking at Maya that Maya had a terrible viewport. You know, you could get the viewport out and move it to the different monitor or something. And Tradition Max did, did not have that. And I thought, oh, that was so unfortunate. So that's the, one of the first features I added into Epic 3D. I was like, there, I can make terrible viewports. <laughs> Here you go on the desk. <laughs> if I can make terrible viewports, you should be able to make terrible viewports. <laughs> Wait, yeah, that's... Uh... Yeah, that's funny. Uh, and the, the thing is, like, you, you, yeah, again, talking about the, um, like, taste and things, like, I, I think uh, Blender doesn't have ter terrible uh, windows. And it's all about don't have, the, oh, they have now, but the way that it works is, like, you, you split. Do you, you try it? You can split and split and split all your, your, your uh, interface. And, you can create combinations but they don't never like the default thing it's like doesn't overlap anything with anything so that is the problem with for instance maya when you have too many window open and you minimize and right. the, the minimize window doesn't have any title and it's like what the hell like soft image when you minimize the minimize like quick and you, you keep the title there and also the position yeah. It was really nice, but the Maya goes down, 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 and when you have three or four, like, ouch, yeah, <laughs> and you start opening uh, another one, another one, and then you realize the one you're looking for was closed long ago, and <laughs> just <laughs> unless it happened to me, I don't know, maybe I'm a disaster with the windows. And by the way, there is a little. If you're still using Maya, have this issue. There is um a little plugin from uh, a Japanese developer. Don't remember the name, but you have like the alt tab, it's similar, but you you have all your windows, ding, 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 the Maya ones, and mm -hmm. you can jump from one to another. Very useful, by the way. Yeah. I feel like I don't really have this problem anymore because I don't use dual monitor setups anymore. I just switched to an ultra wide monitor. Mm -hmm. So I just have one big window, and now the, the Splendor uh, workflow of splitting out views uh that that works out um same thing in houdini i have a desktop created where it's mm. fit for the ultra wide setting and i find that's so much more uh it's such a more useful experience than having two monitors because you don't have the the gap in between the monitors and the borders no. in the middle and yeah. you don't have to choose like do I want this on this screen or this screen? It can be like, well, I want this to take 75% of my screen and then the side will be property panels, but yeah. I want a huge viewport or I don't want a huge viewport. You can kind of mm. choose. And now that ultra monitors are 
much cheaper than yeah. they used to be. And I find like I, I'm done. Yeah, you preach to a, a believer already. Like I, I don't, I don't. I mean, I cannot use two monitors. I, I just ended up having one in the middle, one in the side, and when I use the side, I, I, my neck, s s like sores, and I ended up on on my previous, well, in my previous studio and the one I'm working now. I ask it just I don't want just take one. I I prefer to have a space on my desk than <laughs> than have two screens, and uh, but now where I'm working, they they put me like one big one 27 inch 4k so it's really really cool to work with one at, at home same one screen two screens it's yeah i guess back in the days you, you didn't have choice no there was not that why you have one of these that is slightly curved curved no it's not curved it's not but it's it's it, yeah it's i think 37 37 oh my god must be very long yeah yeah there's room for <laughs> all the the windows and all the dialogues you can put in one in one view if you want yeah so you so you you feel like if you you for instance put maya like full screen and you you need to move your like playing like tennis or ping pong like moving your head to go one yes one, one screen to another <laughs> yeah. almost yeah that's uh I, I never tried one of these i have like it's 25 but it's not it's not full hd it's a little more it's like not 4k but 3k or something like that and it's perfect for me very here in in japan m my i have like little space so everything is very compact so it's <laughs> i think if i put 37 inches here i have to sleep in the, in the street with m <laughs> with a <the> stream <laughs> that's cool yeah yeah, yeah. One day I have to make a podcast about ergonomics. I think it's a, it's a very interesting topic so, because I, 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 I feel the pain sometimes watching some people with two screens and the horrible layout on the on the table mm -hmm. with the Wacom on, on the middle, a big Wacom, and they have the, the keyboard like <laughs> super far to reach and things like that. That's pretty bad for everybody. I mean, neck, arms, everything. That's really cool. Okay, um, so I don't want to take too much your time. I think we already passed the hour. It was like a blast. Um, but um, just taking a quick review of my notes. I think we went over everything we was talking at the beginning to to tackle. And yeah, it's um was a pleasure to talk with you and to <laughs> to see all the madness behind your adventuring especially in oats it's it's great to see this i you put a, well you can see my my face on the camera so you <laughs> know i'm smiling like while watching your your stuff it's it's really great and uh, i'm really looking forward for your new reels when they come out with new stuff it's gonna be great to watch and get some inspiration some motivation to to keep pushing on the rigging and character effects things because i mean you're doing amazing work man <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you.